Uh, excited to have the panel discussion today with a spotlight on tissue engineering. Um, just as a little pre-context to this, um, you know, really excited to be here at this conference. And if we start to think about tissue engineering at the core, it's really a combination of, of matrix and cells that come together to be able to create new products uh, with that potential and the promise to really replace or repair damaged tissue organs and ultimately a solution for transplantable organs as well. Um, I think, you know, the earlier session today, we heard from Peter Marks uh, from the FDA and the excitement around cell therapy with 150 INDs, I think is what he mentioned, already being submitted this year. So you see that momentum, um, which is exciting, I think, for the whole regenerative medicine field. And some of that certainly spills over into tissue engineering as well. If we take a step back for a second and just look at tissue engineering from that standpoint of the combination of, of cells and scaffolds, you know, it really got its start on kind of that acellular side. Many things starting with a synthetic graft, moving into more biologic with extracellular matrix, um, with a lot of focus on indications such as soft tissue reinforcement, hernia repair, wound care products. Um, but in the past year, we've also seen some ad advances of that as well as that field starts to continue on on the acellular side with humicide and some of their phase three uh, clinical studies as they're going forward with a vascular graft. But on the cellular side, and as we think about tissue engineering and that longer term promise, right, it's, it's that combination of cells and matrix. Um, and it's kind of interesting to be here because, you know, one of the first products that were commercialized was Dermagraft. And that was originally from Advanced Tissue Sciences, which was just a few miles down the road, um, which was an exciting, you know, advancement. And that was taking cells, putting them on matrix, and being able to create a skin substitute type product. I think the challenge has been, and what we want to talk about more today, is that was 20 years ago. So what's happened with the field from that first product to where we are today, um, and where are we going? So I think some of the questions we want to certainly address up here today um, go along that line is tissue engineering still holds tremendous promise, but what's really needed to move the field forward? I think the other thing that we look at as well, um, you know, in attending this conference for numerous years and, and, and looking at it, if I go back five years and look at this conference, um, and where cell and gene therapy was, I would say tissue engineering is kind of in that phase. A lot of promise, a lot of things starting to move forward. Um, so that's the other thing that we want to talk about today and, and kind of queue up is as we look at that, um, you know, and some of the breakthroughs that are occurring in cell and gene therapy, how is that helping to advance the field? So I'm joined by two other individuals. So my name is Jeff Ross. I'm the CEO of Miro Matrix. Uh, just quick background, we're actually uh, tissue engineering and focused on creating transplantable organs, but we've also commercialized two acellular-based products based on perfusion decellularization of whole liver. So we're using that platform along with adding the cells, but I'm also joined by uh, Jim McGough, who's CEO of BioStage, and Jason Wertheim, who's a researcher and transplant surgeon at Northwestern University. I'm gonna have them give a quick introduction and then we'll, uh, we'll dive into some questions. So maybe you wanna give a... Sure. So my name is Jason Wertheim. I'm a transplant surgeon at Northwestern University in Chicago. Uh, I've trained as a physician, a surgeon, and a biomedical engineer, so I try to speak all the different languages to translate the technology. Uh, I run a research lab uh, focused in liver and kidney, uh, regenerative medicine and tissue engineering focused in stem cell development. Uh, and we're funded by the NIH, the DOD, uh, and the VA uh, to develop uh, biosynthetic tissues for patients who need it uh, in the future for liver failure. I'm also part of an NIH consortium called Rebuilding the Kidney, uh, and the goal of that consortium is to really build the tools, the scaffolds, the cells, the technology to one day uh, rebuild a transplantable kidney. Yeah, thank you, Doc. Uh, Jim McGorry, I'm the CEO of BioStage. We're a regenerative medicine company in the Boston area. We focus on bioengineer developing bioengineered organ implants for diseases of the esophagus, trachea, and bronchus. We're currently developing a combination uh, product for our pediatric atresia, where one out of every 2,000 children are born with a gap between their upper and lower esophagus. We use mesenchymal stem cells seated onto a scaffold and then that is delivered to regenerate that, uh, that section. Interesting, then the polyurethane comes out and it's only a biologic response. So using a lot of uh, you know, 
cell therapy, tissue engineering, bioreactors, a lot of things into those combination products. Happy to be here. Good. You know, before we dive into kind of get into some of the challenges in tissue engineering, um, maybe we could talk a little bit about what excites you about the field of tissue engineering today? So, you know, I'm, I'm excited by actually a lot of the technologies that we've seen here uh, at the meeting over the last day and a half or so. I think that looking at a lot of the, the new progress in cell therapy will actually help tissue engineers as we try to put new cells on scaffolds it might work to eventually build organs, but also kind of giving that hope to patients. And so that's what's exciting about the future. I wake up every morning looking at kind of the number of patients waiting for an organ for transplant. So there's about 100,000 patients who are now waiting for a kidney for transplant, as an example. We do about, about 20,000 kidney transplants a year. Um, but despite the number of transplants we do day in and day out, uh, night and day, uh, we still can't reach uh, the gap of the patients that need transplantable organs or tissues for, for trauma or congenital um, diseases. And so uh, that need is kind of what, what um, propels me forward to do my research and we treat the, the patients. Um, but what really excites me is the new technologies in, in both cell therapy and, and then in tissue engineering. You know, intimidating to follow, you know, a very prominent uh, transplant surgeon and all the, you know, work that he does in the research side and the, you know, the surgical side. Um, one of the, you know, few that uh, <clears throat> ran a commercially um, cell therapy uh, business, part of, uh, proud to be a Baxter Genzyme alumni, was on the ground floor with um, Genzyme biosurgery within Epicel and Cardicel and really see those advances. But really now seeing how to take that and seeing where it moves into a 3D organ, better understanding the, you know, the micro environment, seeing the combination of other things that can really add to it, and really trying to find that balance of science and medicine and that right clinical need, the business model uh, where these things need to go. Because sometimes it's not, as I think a lot of the people in the room know, the failure of the therapy, but it's the failure of choosing that right indication for that therapy, of trying to make that first gap and leap. It's great to see the things that will happen in you know, generation two, three, or four, but that first hard step is that next piece to get over the chasm, and that's what excites me and drives it as we look to go into these kids and these congenital abnormalities. That's great. You know, from my standpoint, a couple of things excite me about tissue engineering in, in the field today. One is just the advancement, I think, in decellarization technology. And we'll get in a little bit later about the vascularity. But as I talked about in the opening, you know, some of the early products were really cells matrix, and it was really diffusion limited. So we're really limited to these very thin constructs. You know, we could create cardiac muscle, it would contract, but we could see through it. Uh, when you start thinking about how you're gonna treat a patient with that that just had an MI, you know, it doesn't add a lot of functionality back to it. You know, with some of the advancements with perfusion decellarization where one could take a whole organ, decellarize it, and now you've got an intact vasculature to be able to start to now bioengineer truly you know, more functional tissues to reach that promise of tissue engineering. I think is one area that really excites me. The other area is 3D printing. Um, you know, just that ability to start to make constructs. I don't think we're there in terms of micro patterning uh, the vasculature, but you're seeing good advancements now in, in some of the blockier type things, orthopedics and other areas. So I, I think that's starting to move the ball forward in that aspect. You know, as we do talk about some of these newer things and, and where the field is going, from your guys' perspective, and what's the time horizon on some of these things? So. Maybe you, Jason, in, in terms of whole organs and where you see that and, and how that field's going for you. Right. I mean, I think that for myself and, and for, for the patients, the answer is tomorrow. I mean, we want it, we want it today. Um, but, you know, it takes time. Research can be uh, unpredictable. Um, sometimes things take a little bit longer. I think that it would be nice to say we could have a transplantable tissue engineered organ in the next 10 years, maybe become standard of care. Um, there's really that gap, and there's a really motivating factor to try to close that gap. But there are a lot of hurdles that, as a, 
industry and a, a discipline, we, in the grand scheme of we, the folks involved in this area, have identified a lot of hurdles, overcome a lot of those challenges, but there's still some challenges in the future that are left to be tackled that will need to be overcome before we can actually get a transplantable organ. But one of the things you'd mentioned is the vasculature, being able to have a blood vessel system that we can sew to that can then perfuse the cells and the tissues such that we can make thicker tissues that are functional is actually a very important breakthrough that's kind of come to fruition over the last uh, 10 to, to, to 13 years or so. Um, and is really one of the limiting factors that we've had in the field going back from the, the mid 90s uh, where we can now develop these thicker tissues and that's gonna allow us to make larger organs on the scale of a liver or kidney um, and rely beyond just angiogenesis, uh, which was kind of the, the mainstay of the field in the, the later 90s, or early 2000s. Jim, how about your perspective? Continue to see, as, you know, as discussed, the evolution of a number of these areas, and even the, the, the evolution of manufacturing. BioStage is uh, evolution of, uh, of actually a bioreactor company within Harvard Bioscience. And so it, it, it had a lot of knowledge of just understanding how to be able to keep things alive and work, and, you know, and work with it. So it's just the continued advancements of the field. We, we see the, at least the stepwise function into hollow organs before we get into these whole organs and all the, you know, the, the work that's being described because it just seems like the next right step going forward. In our seated scaffold, it's, it's sort of delivering a living tube. And in, that, you know, and in that tube that gets delivered, it creates its own neovascular. So it's working ways around of using other ways to be able to do that. And so seeing those increases at least into a logical next step into whole organs, and then seeing how that interacts with the host tissue, stimulating other you know, angiogenic factors, just all the opportunities in other areas have just spotlighted and advanced these areas too. Yeah, that's right, it's a good point. So it's really a progression of the technology. Mm -hmm. So we saw tissue engineered skin, first was approved in the late 90s and then introduced clinically. Uh, and now we're moving into cartilage and we saw some of those presentations here. Um, hollow organs are gonna precede thicker, larger organs and that probably will be the last uh, structure to be engineered, which would be a, a thicker, larger organ. So it's a progression of that technology and it just takes some time at identifying kind of those new challenges uh, that, um, that will come up with each different tissue structure that we're, uh, we're developing. And I think continued wins along the way as those continue to get into the market, get accepted, um, you know, that, that continues to advance the field as well from a funding standpoint, from an excitement standpoint. So it's good to see the pipeline getting more full than we've seen in the past. Um, Jim, you mentioned a little bit in, in that discussion there, manufacturing, right? And clearly we've seen a lot of, and heard a lot this week or last couple of days on the challenges of cell manufacturing vectors and other things. And, and in tissue engineering, we, we kind of have the unique thing that we have a scaffold that we need to manufacture and we have also got the cell source. Um, so I guess maybe from your perspective, you know, what are some of the unique requirements on the manufacturing side that you're facing today uh, as you're thinking about bringing your product to market? Yeah, thank you. And I think one of the things in thinking about that, as we all do into the different technologies, is it's not the thought that you have to do everything yourself. Um, if other people have expertise in other areas, it's good to tap, in, you know, tap into that. Um, there's a lot going on in companies that, you know, that are maybe even allogeneic now that started autologous, so it's sort of choosing those right cells. We've seen the advancements into the, you know, the bioreactors into advancing these, both um, ex vivo and in vivo, and how, how it's used. So manufacturing plays a tremendous role along the way, and uh, we've seen those, those advancements, particularly now in these combination products of how to bring cells and scaffold and that interaction uh, together. Do you have any comments on 
or thoughts on manufacturing as well? All right. So I think you know I talked a little bit about some of the challenges. Yeah. And so um, in the realm of manufacturing, one is scale up, and so we start with smaller animals. We have to do larger animal trials, eventually go into humans, and so that will involve a, a um, an element of scale. And so can we scale the manufacturing facilities, the manufacturing um, paradigms that we're working with? Um, does organ function scale as we move from a smaller organ to a larger organ in terms of the animal models, as an example, finally developing a release criteria uh, and, um, and regulatory approval through, um, through the federal agencies to eventually be able to get these technologies into patients safely and effectively? Yeah, from our standpoint, you know, we've thought a lot about manufacturing and, and we kind of took a stepwise approach on it. Our end goal is, first product is, to create a, a transplantable liver. And the first step of that was to try not to tackle both of those together, the cell source and, and the finished product as one, but try to break it into two. And, we, and the way that we did that is, is really look at how can you commercialize the matrix by itself. So we set up a whole facility, went through everything in terms of manufacturing. To your point, how do you scale up? So from the beginning, not just can we make one or two of these, how can we make hundreds or thousands of these? Um, and that was really, a, a, I would say, really helpful in terms of getting our facility set up, taking in, you know, understanding what that supply is all the way back from the farmer and the pig, all the way to us receiving it, decelerizing it, what those release criteria are, what the agency wanted in that standpoint to be able to get that product all the way out there. But now we sit with, you know, relatively de-risked on the side of the scaffold and understanding how to, to make that at a GMP and clinical grade level and now really focusing on you know, the side of adding cells back on there. And, and many of the things I would say that cell therapy is dealing with today are the same kind of topics we're looking at. How do you bank? What do you need to do? What do you need to do to the release? But I think in our manufacturing, we actually have one more additional step that we have to think about and continue to think about, and that's shipping and transport. So in the end, you know, um, some products like yours, Jim, may be cryopreserved or they may be fresh, but when we start thinking about truly functional tissues, um, they're likely going to need to be delivered to be ready to be implanted, similar to a donated tissue versus a cryopreserved tissue. So that's something we're continuing to look at as well and trying to develop, to your point, Jason, not you know, when we get there, but how do we start putting those into our process today to make that easier for the end product? That's right. I mean, even now for, uh, in, in the transplant uh, uh, arena, we deal with uh, logistical issues about how we get an organ from point A to point B, how much time do we have uh, tracking those particular uh, uh, organs as they're shipped um, on ice or on specific uh, pumps as an example. Uh, looking, one thing we talk about in the manufacturing area is how do we judge um, function of a biosynthetic organ. Um, well, we, we do that every day in the transplant field, and so we want to know how the organ is functioning before we transplant it, uh, looking at creatinine and other types of metrics that tell us how the organ is functioning before we actually recover it for transplantation. And so in some sense, a lot of those uh, logistical or functional questions we're doing every day in transplantation, but they'll need to be adapted um, for biosynthetic organs, looking at logistics, looking at function and how do we track that and correlate that with outcomes after transplantation. Great. You're just building on your comment there, with your, your point of thinking with that end user in mind, what are you delivering, how is it delivered? You know, our thoughts are, okay, at the end of the day for us, if it's a hollow organ and there has to be a segmental removal and something put back in, you know, our, our thinking from a manufacturing standpoint is our bioreactor looks like a shipping container. That's moved. There's no aseptic movement of that. Things get moved along the way. And just thinking of how all of that works. And so it's very much going down there, you know, in different in different areas because at least ours is being used as a temporary or cell delivery device because it's removed in a biologic response. So it's hard to have a function prior to implant um, strategy because it's a quote neoconduit, right, in a regenerated area. Is that a new esophagus? Is that an esophagus? What's it called? 
does it function? <laughs> and then how do you determine that it functions? And I think with Dr. Marx's presentation, you know, earlier and seeing how the agency is continuing to work under an RMAT structure and just so many ways to be able to work with companies and defining these standards has also been very helpful into the field. And no, no question, you know, ARM plays a big role in helping all of us into those areas. Yeah, I completely agree with that. And in, in the comment that you made too, that you know, you're culturing these in the conditions, so to deliver them, I mean, that's the same way we're looking at it as you do advanced uh, organs and tissues. In some ways, I think it's easier than a cadaver organ where you, you, know, you got an ischemia time and stuff like this. When they're ready, they're actually in their same vessel and potentially shipment and delivery of those will be a lot easier compared to trying to take them out, remove them, you know, and, and flush them. So I, I think that'll extend the time to patients as well. Mm -hmm. So Jim, you mentioned something as well, uh, kind of on the cell side of things. Um, how do you think the advancement in cell and gene therapy has really assisted, or has it assisted in accelerating tissue engineering? I think that, you know, even though these are different disciplines, I think that there's a lot of overlap into, you know, these, you know, these same areas. It's when you ran, I, I ran into another former Genzyme colleague earlier and they were commenting about when, when a little bit when you had a, a cell therapy platform, it was a very difficult business model on your P&L in the past. And now all of a sudden an autologous model was not in vogue at all. But now all of a sudden, what goes around comes around, and there's cycles on it and, and the use. I think the science, is, the science and the medicine are there, and I think that all boats rise uh, you know, with all of this technology move across, across a lot of these different disciplines. That's right. I think that you know, for, for the tissue engineering area, we typically, not, not for every product, but we're typically thinking about scaffolds and cells. Uh, and then there's a third technology, which is a bioreactor, where they are combined and they grow together. Um, but cell therapy and gene therapy are, are two disciplines that are going to help tissue engineering by developing the cells, <coughs> developing functional cells, and potentially being able to alter their characteristics or their function through gene therapy to potentially alleviate disease if it's a uh, an inborn error of metabolism that we could use autologous cells and correct a defect and then transplant a partial liver back in. Um, so to your point, they're all, they're all, it, the technology rises all boats um, and it's very translatable from one area to the other and I think really um, it is great news for tissue engineering because we really need to tap into those different cell sources and that will enhance the products that you know, we're developing over time. Yeah, I agree. As we look at the field and other things, I mean, some of the, the groundbreaking efforts that are being put forth with the agency, quality, um, standards, I think that really helps define and, and should you know, lessen some of the longer runways associated with tissue engineering because we should be able to take advantage of those as we come forward and then focus on more of whole release criteria with the end tissues in mind. Right. Yeah. Along those lines, I mean, we heard a little bit about RMAT this morning. Uh, what are your guys' thoughts on RMAT and the potential of tissue engineering? Is, 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 I guess from your standpoint, Jim, has that helped you in your business or, or that legislation? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that was described earlier. I mean, just uh, whatever, a step down from breakthrough. I forget how it was described. but. You know, and seeing the number of companies that have moved into that direction. So just, it's the, it's the agency working in a great dialogue with the companies. So, you know, very true. But it's a lot of these definitions on, you know, what is, uh, you know, clinically relevant in other areas. And so, but very, very strong, absolutely. Do you guys see any challenges at the FDA in terms of regulation uh, mm -hmm. pertaining to tissue engineering and, you know, the fact that we are a biologic and a scaffold and, and how those conversations go. You know, just as a, you know, end of one example, at a, at a pre-IND meeting in a combination, we have CBER and CDRH, we had 17 people on the line, um, an, hour, an hour call, and um, it's just really hard to do the math with everybody that wants to be an expert up early. And so it's well intended, but it can get complicated a little bit, and we're working through it. I think it really puts the effort on the sponsor to be able to 
help the agency understand you know, what you're doing a little bit more. And if it's not as clear, it can get a little circus-like. But I think that, this, that, that responsibility is on both sides, both the sponsor as well. But there, there are a lot of people involved. Yeah, and I think some of the you know, recent termination and clarification of tissue engineering as a biologic, hopefully we'll start to shift that a little bit to, to help kind of clarify who, who is the point person. And uh, you know what's the best agency to go through to get the right people in the room? I guess we got about four minutes left. We got, we got one more question for the panel, but wanted to open it up to the audience, see if there's any questions uh, prior to closing. Yes. Uh -huh. So I, I have a question. Um, Thank you. So my question is about the origin of the scaffold. So to me, uh, you can have three different, uh, fundamentally, very different scaffolds to start with, human, xenogenic, or synthetic. Can you speculate a little bit about the future for these three and how you see they can be part of a tissue engineer product? Yeah, I guess from that standpoint, I mean, we deal with that a lot. And, and, and what we looked at is, you know, you could start with human, and that's more straightforward. Um, but we wanted to prove that you could start with a, a porcine material. And I think there's a lot of history in tissue engineering. There's a lot of products that have been commercialized based on pig and bovine uh, decellerized tissue. So I think from a, from a clinical standpoint, you know, thousands and thousands of patients have been implanted with them without any adverse events associated to immunology. So I, I think the field continues to build on that and use that as the basis for it. Um, certainly, there's a lot of synthetic ones. If you, if you look at hemocyte, right, they're using a the synthetic, grow cells on it, and then decellerize it. Um, so it's kind of the combination of those two. But I think from a biomaterial standpoint, at least what I've seen, um, is it really depends on what you want that host response to be and, and what that longer term is. And I think those are some of the key things that we can use in the field to continue to build, build on. I don't know if you guys have another perspective on that. It, it probably would, would be a little bit dependent upon what the exact application is. Right. I think if, uh, if you're looking at a, a planar tissue uh, or, a, or a tube, so to speak, we might be able to, to utilize a synthetic material. Um, uh, but then again, just from a cell sourcing or, or a scaffold sourcing perspective for larger organs, it, it does make sense to, to look into the, to the ability to, uh, to obtain xenogenic uh, uh, sources as well. So a little bit looking towards the application, I think. That and the advances in biomaterials is remarkable, too. Uh, you can take a synthetic scaffold and look at the scaffold, the microenvironment, the pore size, the porosity, and the whole area. And you could, you could with the cell types, you could make that resorbable. You can make that you know, I interact or removable. So there's a lot of different things depending on the anatomical position, where it is and what you're trying to do. All of them are great, but then they have, ooh, those things cut on the other side. If it's resorbable and then there's downstream enzymatic issues in other areas, removable, then do you need a stent to manage it? So all good, good opportunities, but I think it's where it's being used that matters. Right. right. Yeah. Any additional questions? Well, I'd, I'd oh, just sorry. add, and, and if anybody else has any questions, please volunteer. I would just add that, you know, as we see cells um, can be modified themselves through gene therapy, we may need to modify the scaffolds themselves. So we may see a hybrid that might be a uh, partially naturally derived scaffold, but then something that's synthetically uh, modified. So a biosynthetic scaffold actually might be uh, an option as well, depending upon the um, Again, depending on the application. Yeah. And I think it's really application dependent too, as you guys stated. I mean, what we try to do is just keep it as simple as possible um, and, and not try to over engineer something um, because it seems to have a lot more of a response and just trying to match what you're going for. Um, so I, I guess with that, we've only got about a minute left. Uh, maybe your guys' last perspective, 30 seconds each, on what you guys think is going to advance the field. Well, I think a lot of the progress is going to advance the field across the board on, on cells, on scaffolds, and, and bioreactors. Um, I, I think that uh, what's going to really move us forward is new breakthroughs in cell technology uh, and cellular therapy, and that's going to catalyze a lot of the progress. And so overall, I think there's, there's a lot of hope uh, for, the, for the future and, and hope for um, the patients who, who need the, uh, the healing tissue. 
the, the continuing combination discussions, right? Using, you know, different, you know, different areas to do the different things that are needed. Great. Well, thank you guys for being part of the panel. Thanks for everyone attending. Uh, I, I think the future is pretty bright for tissue engineering as we continue to bring these products to market, and it'll be great, great for the patients in the end. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.